I know we can make the change for the better. That's right. There's a better way. Now is the day that we have a time. Don't let it slip away. You can make the change and now your life be an example. Shine the light. Oh, oh, there's a better way. Now is the day that we have a time. Don't let it slip away. You can make the change and now your life be an example. Shine the light. Well, take it to heart. Everything in the world plays its part. Remember, lots wiped onto a pillar of salt. Nothing they could do to stop this from reaching you. Seeking for the higher one, you know just what to do. Many carved and the chosen few. But no matter what you have, remember him that gave his life for you. So you can take your stand, and then you'll overstand the universal covenant he made with Abraham. There's a better way. Now is the day. That you have a time, don't let it slip away. You can make the change in your life. Be the example and shine your light. Oh, oh, there's a better way. Now is the day that you have a time, don't let it slip away. We can make the change in your life. Be the example and shine your light. Well, government skills they will take away. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, they're corrupt in other ways. Don't you be? Confused and don't be captivated. The lifestyle that they choose is completely overrated. They murder, they rob, they rape and abuse. On top of it all, the earth they pollute. The preacher, the teacher, and the recruit. Well, all of them are running from the rising of the truth. There's a better way. Now is the day that you have a time. Don't let it slip away. You can make the change in all your life. An example, shine the light. Oh, oh, there's a better way. Now is the day that you have a time. Don't let it, don't let it slip away. Hey, hey, you can make it change. Yeah. Out of one, so as one, we must live. One God, one King, one righteous community. Once lost, now found. Everybody know their duty. Many roads, many rivers. It's up to your choosing. One leads to life, the other you lose. And rejoice and proclaim. Your cry was not in vain. Well, I may fade away, but His word remains the same. There's a better way. Now is the day that you have a time. Don't let it slip away. Make the change and now your life be the example. So shine the light, move on. There's a better way. Now is the day that you have a time. Don't let it slip away. You can make the change and now your life. You are the example. So shine the light.
tonight. Uh, I have a, a subject the Holy Spirit put on my heart. Uh, it's called uh, The Power of Prayer. You can really title it however you want, because I have no idea what the title really is going to, going to mean when this is all said and done. All I know is the Father has said that there's never been a move of God. There has never been anything that has ever happened in our life where we have not fallen to our knees and asked Him to move. And so I'm going to put this topic on, I want you to hear what the Scriptures have to say. I'm going to let Him, we're going to go through tons of Scriptures. Is that Okay. And let the word speak to you. First of all, let's talk about it avails much. We're just going to get right into it because I know, I know that I know there will not be enough time for this. James 5.16 says, confess your trespasses, your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible defines a righteous man as one who does the right thing, and the Bible defines the right thing is what he tells you to do, and the Bible defines what he tells you to do as his commandments. Starting with the top two, by the way. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that if it would not rain, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. That's very prophetic, by the way, but we don't have time to get into it. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. This is a man who made it not rain for three and a half years. Folks, if it doesn't rain for three months, everything dies. What happens for three and a half years? No rain. The Mississippi River would probably dry up. That is a lot of no rain. That's called a famine of Yahweh's word. The man was so righteous that he actually could turn it on and turn it off, and Yahweh yielded to his vessel, his prophet, Eliyahu. You say, well, Jim, I I don't have that kind of righteousness. Are you kidding me? You have the righteousness of the Messiah living inside of you. The only difference is, is you're not walking in righteousness. You see, there's two types of righteousness that are found in the Bible. There's the righteousness of Christ. We got that one down, 1,700 years of Christianity, 38,000 denominations all around the world. We got it figured out. Christ is righteous. We get it. But there's a second righteousness that's not preached from the pulpit. One is salvific. That is Christ. That is the Messiah in you. He covers you. His righteousness is the only way you get into the Shemaim, into the heavens, is from his righteousness. But there's a whole nother righteousness. It's the righteousness of our works. In other words, there's something to do. It's kind of like your children are your children because they're your children. They can't get away from being your children. They are your children. They're covered in your blood, if you will, your righteousness. But your children are not blessed until they obey. You can be the richest son on the planet and live a 50,000 square foot house. Disobey the Lord of that house and you'll find yourself as a pauper under a bridge. We need to understand the difference between Eliyahu, Elijah, and us is simply one thing. He walked in his righteousness. He did what the Father said. And he didn't ask questions. He lived by the Spirit. Mark 11, 24, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you obey, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Do you know what this is? This is a this is a a very cryptic statement if you look at it properly. Because what this is saying, this is an outside of time statement. This statement is made for you to believe that you are outside of time. What do I mean by that? If I had a a whiteboard here, I would say, okay, on this side right here is the beginning. This is where you pray. Over here is when you receive that prayer. So when when we prayed for Jim Riley, 30 seconds later is when he received his healing. When did he really receive his healing? If you remove yourself outside of time, then you see the healing already. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So when you, that's what he's saying. He said, whatever things that you ask when you pray, when you pray and you believe that you receive them, meaning that you take yourself outside of time and say, wait a minute, I'm outside of time. If I'm outside of time, then I'm in the resurrection. Which means that if I'm in the resurrection, I'm healed. So I thank the Father for my healing. Here's the problem that we have when we pray for healing. 
We expect the Lord and we look for healing of our bodies right now. Does the scripture say that? Or does it say to recognize and believe that you receive them? And some of you, your eyes are crossing, so let me say that a different way. If you take yourself outside of time when you pray and you believe, it doesn't matter when you get healed because you are healed. Whether it happens now or at the resurrection, you should thank him that even in the resurrection that you are healed because he doesn't have to do that. For the way that we eat and live our lives, we deserve to live for eternity in the bodies that we have. We do it to ourselves. Why does he have to heal us and make us healthy and strong? He doesn't have to do that. So when you pray, believe that you receive it instantaneously. What we do is we go, okay, God, I just I pray right now that you'd heal me. And then we get disappointed if it doesn't happen in, in 28 seconds. And because we get disappointed, we miss the fact that two seconds later we were going to heal, but he removed it because we didn't receive it. You must receive it. The days are over, ladies and gentlemen, of the talking heads that say it's all about getting healed. It's not about getting healed, but those things do happen when you walk in his ways, when you walk in his spirit. How many really want to see the Holy Spirit poured out? Are you ready for that? Are you sure? Because I talk to people in the, in the Hebraic Roots movement, and I'm telling you right now, they're scared to death of the Holy Spirit. They threw it away when they walked out of the last church they were in. They gave up on it. Oh, we don't want that. We just want to walk in the Torah. Read your New Testament, ladies and gentlemen, because Peter took a rag, prayed on it, and sent it to someone and said, this will heal you the second that rag touches them. I'd be kicked out if I did that. I'd be fired in a heartbeat. My New Testament tells me that people got healed. My, people, my, my New Testament tells me that miraculous things happen daily. Why is it that we're afraid of miraculous things? Because we don't walk outside of time. We walk in what we see. And we don't really want it, to be honest. We don't really want it. Philippians 4, 6 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but on everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of Yahweh, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Yeshua HaMashiach. Do not be anxious. Are you kidding me? Half of, our, half of your problems exist because you don't know how to live by the Spirit. Is the Spirit in time or outside of time? It's outside of time. So quit looking with these eyes and the glasses that mankind has put on you. Why are we anxious? Why is it that we can't do? Why do, why do people say be, be afraid of the enemy? He's a big bad guy. Last time I, I, I checked, he was defeated. Yeah. Don't be anxious about anything. Pull yourself outside of time. I'm telling you, I'm giving you one of my tricks when I pray. Pull yourself outside of time and look at it that way. And when you get yourself outside of time, man, it is nothing but victory and light. Woo. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. I can throw things too. <laughs> First John 3, 22, check this out. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because all oh, 38,000, 37,999 denominations miss this, this scripture. Because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Folks, that wasn't out of Deuteronomy. That's out of 1 John. That's not out of the Torah, or is it? We receive from him because we do what he said. Now, isn't the, listen, the Bible is nothing but a marriage. How many know that? Adam and Eve start out as a marriage, right? The whole thing, he's a bridegroom, we're the bride, right? The whole thing is all about a ketubah, a contract, a wedding contract, and walking that out in real life. So I like, this is why I love marriage, and I love relationships, and I love to teach on it, because it, it, when we get it down to brass tacks, this is what he's saying. If you want to receive from your wife, you better keep her commandments. And do what pleases her. 
Because husbands, you will never receive anything from your wife if you don't do what pleases her. In the year 2002, I bought my wife a brand new 2002 four-wheel drive Kirby vacuum cleaner. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Four-wheel drive vacuum cleaner, are you kidding me? Put my kids on it, man, and just shh. She wasn't so excited. It's not what pleased her. I was like a kid in a candy store waiting for her to open that up. Because I couldn't wait to use it. But it's not what pleased her. So I took back the camouflage 12 gauge too. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. You know what this means? This means you pray it all the time. How many pray all the time? You need to pray all the time. What does that mean? Megan, I heard last week uh, when I was in Charlotte, I heard her say this. It was a beautiful analogy. We need to drip all the time. Everywhere you go, everything that you, you do, you need to be praying. You know why? Because every time that you take a step and every time you take a breath, the enemy is, is praying against you. Right. He's fighting against you. He's speaking into your ear. You may not know it. If you had any idea of the supernatural right now and the things that are happening in the supernatural, you would be praying all the time. I prayed, Father, open my eyes and help me to see the things that I cannot see and help me to see into the supernatural realm. He started to do that and I told him, stop. And you laugh, ladies and gentlemen, but it wasn't funny because what I was experiencing and what I was seeing was scaring the living daylights out of me. And some of you have never experienced the supernatural. You've never experienced or seen a demon or an angel or felt the presence of an evil spirit. Last week, I felt this spirit and it was following me around. I don't care what you think about this. This is, what, yeah, this is my, my walk, my chest I'm opening up. I'm giving you an internal of the reality that this spirit that has been commissioned to destroy me and take down this ministry dropped off the people that it used and it followed me around the office. It had absolutely no ability to touch me as far as uh, getting into, into my inner being. But it had a certain amount of authority and I could feel it. I could feel it following me. It began to crush my head and I could feel this, 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 this unbelievable spirit. Whenever I feel the, whole, uh, the, the supernatural, I feel it right between my eyes. And I found out through medical science that that's actually uh, your conscience. Very, very, very sensitive part of your brain. So I can feel the Holy Spirit. And I can feel the demonic realm. When it passes by me, it's like a light bulb goes off. And I know something's going on, and so I start pressing in. As I started to pressing in, I, I, was, I, I could feel this unbelievable force. I've never felt it like this. It was so powerful, it was beginning to paralyze me. And as I was talking to someone, I said, you know, I feel like the chaos is around me. And the second that I used the word chaos, my two, finger, my two small fingers on my left hand, it was like somebody grabbed them and broke them, and I screamed like a baby. And this person said, are you okay? And I said, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I'm such a blockhead, I didn't put two and two together. <laughs> I didn't go to college. Maybe they teach you that in college. I don't know. I went home that night. I laid in bed with my wife, and I began to explain to her what happened to me that afternoon. As I explained to her, and as I got to the part where I said I felt like there was something following me, it grabbed my fingers again. It was like somebody took a knife, put it in my, my, my nerve, and twisted it, and I screamed again like a baby, except this time I was ready. I recognized where this was coming from, and I took 30 seconds, and I rebuked the enemy, and I said, you get away from me. You get behind me, Asatan. You have no power or authority over me. Get away. Instantly, it went away. And I grabbed my fingers, and my wife said this, nuh -uh. I promise. She's like, are you serious? She was just reading a book. And I said, yeah, they don't hurt anymore. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah. You see, all he can do is take your fingers and bend them back. So what? So I had to have a little pain. You know, why did the Holy Spirit allow that? That was my question. Why did you allow him to do this?
And the father said, you asked me to let you see into this realm. Are you sure you want to see? You know what it caused me to do? It caused me to fall on my knees and repent that I thought that I was out here by myself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a war for your wife, for your children, for your spouse, for you. You need to wake up and quit despising the supernatural. Because that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do is think it doesn't even exist. Yeshua answered and said, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even you say to this mountain, be taken up and be thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Matthew 6, 9, I love this. The Our Father. Why don't we pray the Our Father? Because most of us grew up Catholic. But let me, let me read it to you. Disciples came to Yeshua and said, how do you want us to pray? How should we pray? The rabbis say, pray this way. You say, what do you say? He doesn't say, pray Yeshua, pray to Yeshua. He says, pray to the Father. He's the one that handles out all, all, all the blessings and the curses. I'm the mediator. He says, our Father, who in the Shemaim, Kadosh is your Shem. Hallowed be your name. Your Malkut come, your kingdom come, your will be done. You get that? Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily lechem, our daily bread. It doesn't say your daily steak. Although I tend that might be a mistranslation. The super new King James would have said steak. <laughs> and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. You get this? Folks, we don't do this. We ask for Yahweh to heal us while we have bitterness and hatred in our heart and anger in our heart. Did you know you are not allowed to come near the, the Lord God with, with bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart? The Psalms say that if you have unforgiveness in your heart, he will not even listen to your prayer. Not that he won't answer it, it won't even hit his throne because his angels will knock it down like a professional racquetball player. Won't allow it to happen. We better check our hearts. We want the power of the living God to come. You got blackness in your heart. You know what happens when you offer profane fire before him? You will die. I am a bit nervous about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when you mix it with the Torah. Do you know why? Because when you mix the Torah with the Holy Spirit, you are at a standard that is off the charts. You are at a perfect standard, meaning that there is a requirement for you to come near Him. You better understand what holiness is. You better define it the way the Bible defines it. Lead us not into temptation. Into temptation. You will be tempted, but lead us not into it, or we get consumed by it. But deliver us from evil. And he doesn't stop there. And I love this part. It's my favorite part. You should end every pattern of your prayer with, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What is the kingdom? That's a whole message or two right there. <laughs> That's a dangerous question for me to ask from the pulpit. But the kingdom is in you. Did you know that? Which means that you're owned. You don't have the right over your own body. You don't have the right to get angry at your brother. Are you kidding me? He's owned by the same person. How do you have the right to make a judgment over your brother when you don't own him? Kyla comes to me and she has a little baby and Malia is trying to take the baby or actually it's mostly reversed. Malia has a baby and our, my young one is always trying to take it away. And what do I say? Kyla, give it back to Malia because it's hers. You see, Kyla has no right to take it. It's not hers. There's an authority issue. We don't have the right to take from our neighbor or to even unforgive our neighbor. 
Your neighbor is not yours. Let's move on because i got a lot I want to go through. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Proverbs 28, 9 says, oh boy, this one's tough. Everybody close your ears. You don't want to hear this one. <laughs> Proverbs 28, 9 says this. I don't know how we didn't hear this in, in our Christian denominations. If one turns away his ear from hearing the Torah, which is what it is in Hebrew, even his prayer is an abomination. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what he just said? If you turn your ear from hearing the law, let me say it the way that it's meant uh, in the Hebrew. Shema, if you turn your way from doing, Shema, hearing and doing. Because it's not enough just to hear. Of course, we hear. I was in Charlotte this past weekend. Went to, uh, they took me to the the fastest growing uh, Christian church in America. 37 year old kid. There was 1,500 people in this unbelievable auditorium. They pass out earplugs when you walk in. He only shows up to one of the campuses, and the other six campuses, the same size, in the same city, a giant jumbo screen comes up from the floor, and they broadcast him on that screen. As he had in all of his eloquence and everything that he said, He talked about Rachel and Leah, and he said that Jacob worked for Leah, what he thought was Rachel, for seven years. And that was like the law of God, as he said. I said, oh, wow. Lucky me. The only message that I I get to ever hear from this guy, and he's talking about the law of God and grace. Go figure. Let's see what he has to say. And he sets up the straw man and he says that in the Old Testament before Christ, you have to keep the law of God. You have to work to get grace, to get Rachel. But then when Yeshua came, when Jesus came, he said that you don't have to work. You get grace first and then you can keep the word of God. See how he changed it? Because the here we've all, been, we've all grown up that the word of God is the New Testament. And it's only the parts of the New Testament that we want to we wanna, we wanna follow. What he should have said, which would have been true, he was so close, was that in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, you have to work in order to receive the grace. But when Yeshua came, you get grace to keep the law. You get the power on high to keep the instruction manual. You can't keep the law for salvation, but you get salvation so you can keep the the instructions. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and blown and tossed by the wind. We have a problem with doubting. Almost done, and then we're going to get into some meat. 1 Timothy 2, 1, this is all introduction. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. All people. It doesn't say your loved ones. It says all people. 1 Chronicles 5, 20, and they were... They were helped against them, and the Hagrites were delivered into their hand, and all who were with them, for they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayers because they put their trust in him. Do you know how many times in the Bible that Yahweh changed his mind and did unbelievable things because his people cried out to him? As I studied this out, man, and and went through almost every story in the Bible, the hundreds and hundreds of times that the word prayer and pray and prayed is used, the one constant that I found in all the scriptures, and we're going to look at a few of those, is that never once did a patriarch sit down and go, Dear Jesus, I just pray you hear me. Amen. Didn't happen that way. Yahweh only hears the squeaky voice. It's just like us. He wants to hear our supplications. He moves when we have passion. So let's start off in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Turn with me in your Bibles. If you don't bring a Bible, then I assume you have it memorized. It is your sword. Chapter 1 verse 8 says this, Then Elkanah, her husband, this is talking about Hannah. Hannah wants a baby. Elkanah, her husband, said to Hannah, Why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Just like a man to say that. (laughs) Woman, why are you crying? Am I not the stud that you married? Am I not good enough? I am ten sons. 
Then Hannah threw the remote control across the living room and arose (laughs) after they had finished eating dinner and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of Yahweh, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. Finish this message, ladies and gentlemen. Don't get up from your, from your televisions or your internet right now. I want you to listen to this message all the way through. And it happened as, he continu- as she continued praying before Yahweh that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah also said, Hannah said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint, excuse me, my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in shalom. And the Elohim of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So what do we deduce from this? Number one, she wanted it so bad that she came to the high priest, and she fasted, and she prayed, and she brought her supplications with tears. Until she heard an answer. What do we do? We come before the Lord and we pray a prayer, you know, before breakfast or before dinner. And, and, you know, we'll say another one a little bit later. She wanted a baby so bad that she literally fell on her knees weeping. And she wasn't going to leave until she had an answer from the Lord. Do you do that? Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. As we ramp this up. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of numbers of the years specified by the word of Yahweh through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. This next verse is critical. Then... I set my face towards the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. There seems to be a pattern in Scripture of people falling on their knees and sackcloth and ashes. They don't move. They, su- they supplicate before their God. We've lost this art. We don't understand how to pray. The American prayer is no different than walking through a fast food drive through where we throw up a prayer. When was the last time that you got up in the morning, got on your knees? Even the Muslims do that three times a day. And he goes on and he starts, the first thing he does is repent. This is key. You can't come before before Yahweh with anything. You have to repent. If you offended your brother, you have to go to your brother. Did you know that if you break the scriptures and you don't repent for the rest of your life, he will not hear your prayers? He doesn't say, hey, I won't won't hear your prayers for that day. Do you realize the seriousness of our king? There is protocols and rules and regulations on how you approach him. If you break his commandments, he will not hear your voice. The only voice he will hear is, Father, forgive me. So every prayer, when you are in supplication, should start out that way. Father, forgive me. Open my heart. Show me if I'm missing anything. If I've offended a brother in the smallest amount, I want to err on the sign of caution. Show me and give me the strength to repent. Watch this. Did I highlight it somewhere? Now, while I was speaking, in verse 20, and praying, and confessing my sin and the sins of my fathers, you see the pattern? And presenting my supplication before the Lord for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, 
being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. This is a, 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 a major point that I want to make this tonight. We are stuck in the physical realm. What you see right now is simply a man. But if our eyes were opened, you would see angels all around. And when Daniel prayed, angels were dispatched. Do you think it's just because of Daniel? Oh, he had a cool name. That's maybe why. No. The angels are dispatched for every righteous saint that prays. The reason why some of you live defeated lives is because you have no clue how to supplicate. You have no idea what the formula is. We've taught to pray, read our Bibles, and to go to church. But why is it that we can't pray for more than five minutes and we get a Bible study together and we, we, we don't even, you know, we, we say, okay, who wants to go first? And no one even raises their hand. We have no fervor. No, we have nothing inside of us that wants to pray. We sit in Bible studies and 10 minutes goes by from one person to the next person. If we're in the first century with Daniel and you get nine Daniels around, they're talking over each other because they want to pray so bad. Who would not want to come before the Lord God? Who would not want to be first in line to see his face and to put your request before the king? What if there was only 10 answers and there's 11 people? We would be running to the throne for the answers. And you wonder why your petitions don't even get heard. If I'm God and, I, and, I, and I've got 10 of my saints sitting around and we have a Bible study and we say, who wants to pray? And nobody says they, they want to pray. I'm not answering their prayers. They don't really want me. So somebody finally pipes up and starts praying because enough time has gone by. Someone's got to do it. Like it's the hardest, like we're picking up a car. It's the hardest thing in the world to do. We have lost the art, ladies and gentlemen, of sackcloth and ashes. We don't even know what a sackcloth and ash is. We need to learn from the patriarchs. Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it's a stiff-necked people. Watch this. Now therefore, let me alone. Get out of my way. I'm going to destroy these people from among you. Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, with Yahweh his Elohim, and said, Yahweh... Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm him, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Folks, that is some serious guts to speak to the Almighty and say, time out, Father, I can't let you do this. Back down. These are your people. If Yahweh came up to me, and these are the same people that tried to stone Moses. And if, 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 if I was Moses and these people were against me and started complaining, why did you bring us out of Egypt? We were having steak and lobster back in Egypt. Let's get rid of this guy. And Yahweh says, Moses, get out of my way. I'd be like, okay, fine. Here you go. Go get him, Lord. Yes. Get Korah first. He gets on my nerves. Moses was chosen to be Moses because he loved even his enemies. You couldn't convince Moses to kill the Israelites, even when they had slapped him on his both cheeks and there's nothing left. Do you want to know what it takes to be a husband? You better love your children in such a way that you could get down on their knees, on your knees, at their level. Look them in the eye. When you walk in the door, I love coming home with six girls. It's like a stampede to hug dad. And Malia's the best by far. She, 
I have to get down on her level because she, she's like figured out the whole football thing that the best way to bowl dad over is to get him right in the, in the midsection. So she comes and wraps her arms around me, squeezes me. Problem, there's no, there's no bones around the belly. And if I'm not ready for it, 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 it just takes my breath away because she can squeeze. I got to get down on one knee and I want to hug her. The Father is looking for that kind of leadership. Get down on your knees. Moses beseeched his God to turn away his wrath. And you know what Yahweh did? He changed his mind. He changed his mind. I'm praying for my enemies because he died for them too. And if it wasn't by his grace, I would be his enemy. Acts chapter 12. Still in the introduction. Acts chapter 12. Peter's in prison. They grab him, throw him in prison. And here's what happens. It says in verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to Yahweh for him by the ecclesia, by you, by the congregation. Not five minutes of prayer. It was a, it was a 24-hour house of prayer. Constantly they were praying. They refused to believe that the apostle Peter was going to stay in prison. They refused to believe it. So what happened? Well, let's read it. When the hair was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Folks, some of you have real bondage in your life, and you need the chains to fall off your feet and your hands. The Bible says that if you don't confess your sins to one another, you will not be free and you will not experience the presence of the Almighty. You need to open your chest. It is part of the formula. Call someone that you know. Call someone that you don't know. That'll make you really uncomfortable. <laughs> Why can't we do that? Why can't we say, okay, I'm, go I'm going to confess my sins to the person that is three rows behind me. I don't care who it is. Why does it matter? Five letters. P-R-I-D-E. That's it. It's just pride. That's the only reason why it matters. I should be able to confess my sin to everyone in here. What do I got to hold on to? Why do I want to hold on to it? The Bible says, it's real simple. Confess your sins to one another. Times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord when we do so. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Who wants to go first? <laughs> the angel said, gird yourself, tie on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Do you realize that the gospel has been given? Do you realize why this is being said? Listen to this. The angel comes to him and says, gird yourself. After he was set free and the shackles went by, after Yeshua came into your life and you confessed them into your life, instantaneously the shackles fell from your body. The problem is, is that no one told you the next verse. It says, gird yourself, tie on your sandals, put on your garment and follow me. Yeshua said the same thing. Follow him. Some of you want a lightning bolt experience. I want emotion. I want you to, I, I want to know. I want to cry. The Bible says, just follow him. Is that not enough? What if we never felt him? Is it not enough to follow him? I want both. And I will not stop until I receive both. Because he offers it for all those that want it. Lastly, we're going to end up in the book of Nehemiah. This is where I want to spend my time. This book is a chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line history and future of this ministry. 
We're going to start in verse 3 of chapter 1 of Nehemiah. The southern kingdom, the northern kingdom is already taken away into captivity into Syria, beginning to be dispersed into the then known world. The southern kingdom of Judah has been taken captive into Babylon. And then Babylon gets taken over. And some of the people go back living in Jerusalem. Ezra's there. You have the story of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther all packed into one time period, overlapping each other. And this is where we are in the book of Nehemiah. So he's, he's a cupbearer to the king. He says, and they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in the great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Do you see the pattern again? Nehemiah finds out this information and he fasts and he prays and he sits in sackcloth and ashes and he is for many days mourning. Who does this? Today someone is in sackcloth and ashes and mourning and crying out to their God and we act like Eli and we say, what's wrong with this person? Are you drunk? That's not how you pray. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept again, mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. There's something significant about fasting. And one of the biggest reasons why American Christianity or church has fallen to its knees is because we love to eat. We're a bunch of fat, lazy believers in the spiritual realm. What we see in the, in, the, in the physical realm patterns the spiritual realm. What do they say today? Obesity is at an all-time high in America, higher than it's ever been in the history of 250-something years or whatever it's been, however long it's been. And it's the same in the spiritual realm, ladies and gentlemen. We are lazy. We don't even, we can't, we, 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 we loathe the idea of skipping, not a meal, a snack in between. Much less skipping a meal, fasting. Are you kidding me? After one day, we're like dying. I'm going to die. Some of these, these men and women, 21 days Daniel went. And look who he got. Gabriel. You fast for 24 hours and you wonder why you get a, an angel that shows up with a half a wing. I'm here. <laughs> what can I do for you? <laughs> you want power? Go 21 days. So listen to how he starts out. You'll see the pattern. I'm telling you there's a pattern here. And I said, this was what he said. I pray, Yahweh God of heaven, great awesome God. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now. This is his prelude. Day and night for the children of Israel, your servants. He does not go into his prayer of what he wants yet. Watch what he does first. He says, And I confess the sins of children of Israel, which we've sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, have not kept your commandments, your statutes, your ordinances, which you've commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather you from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen and dwelling for my name. If you want to see your, your wives and your husbands and your children restored, begin to keep his commandments through the spirit of the Ruach HaKodesh and you will see amazing things happen. Amen. This isn't just a physical thing at the end of time that the real physical Israelites and those that call upon his name will come back. It is right now you have this promise. Keep his commandments. Do what he says. Get excited about the Lord God and he will come to you. He will heal your land. That's good. That's good. 
Now these are your servants in verse 10 and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire. Do you get this? Desire. Let's see what the word desire means. In Hebrew, it means desire. It means that you have pleasure in you desire, you sweat blood. You desire it so bad. Do you hear what he's saying? He's giving us the formula. He says, only listen to the servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servants prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And this is one of the most incredible lines in all of that chapter, much less the entire Bible. is The, last, uh, the entire book is this last half a verse. For I was the king's cupbearer. I would have thought for sure that was the king's lead intercessor. He was the lead prayer warrior for the king. After a prayer just like that. Are you kidding me? He was the cupbearer. Folks, you, you can be a plumber, you can be a carpenter, you can be whoever you are. You know, for years up until two nights ago, until Thursday night... I thought, okay, well, you know, my gift is, is, is prophecy and preaching the, the word and teaching. My gift is not intercessor. I'm not a prayer warrior. Their father said, who the heck said that you're not a prayer warrior? Who gave you that right to stand down when you're at your post? Come on, come on, come on. You are a prayer warrior. You're just copped out and you said, oh, I can't do that. I can't pray for an hour and 10 minutes straight. And the father says, oh, yeah, watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, what I was really saying is, is, is I'm not really in a war. This is my part over here. No wonder the enemy was clobbering me. I don't know how to pray. Verse 5, it says, And I said to the king, if it please, so, so the king says, you know, what's going on? What's happening? Why are you so upset? Now we're in the month of Nisan. First month of the year, getting ready for Passover, 14 days before Passover. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. This is very amazing. Uh, uh, Bana, the word rebuild, because it has the, uh, the, the connotation of, of, of obtaining children of progenating because remember in ancient israel it's an agricultural society how do they build you don't just have two kids there's no such thing as saying i'm the only child if you're an only child your family dies there's nobody to work the farm so you had multiple 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 children you are building your household this is why children are a blessing amen so he wants to go back and rebuild it. Now, now catch this. He's not in Judah. He's not living there. There's thousands of people living in Jerusalem. Forty-something thousand people. More than 40,000 people living in Jerusalem at the time. Already have their houses going on. Nobody knows who on earth Nehemiah is. Nor does anybody care. So the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, I think that's funny. Kings are not allowed to speak without the queen. It's the same today. How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So here we go. Watch this. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river, in verse 9, and gave them the king's letter. So the king gives them everything he needs to go on his journey. By the way, this whole book is your spiritual life. It's your spiritual journey. You need to read this book. It will give you everything that you need to succeed in your walk with him. And it will prophetically tell you what's going to happen next. Because the very first thing that happens is Nehemiah realizes that the walls are down and his city, his inheritance is in need of him. He cares that his people are without protection of the walls. The second thing that happens is, is he falls on his knees and in prayer and supplication and fasting and sackcloth and ashes and tearing his chest open, he comes before his God and he asks forgiveness for other people. When was the last time that you prayed and asked forgiveness for somebody else? 
We barely do it for ourselves. And the next thing he does is he went to the king. And he said, okay, king, now that I'm forgiven, now that I'm clean, now that I'm clean before you and I've opened up my chest, I need you to give me and grant me what I need to go on my spiritual journey to be part of the solution of of building up the walls. And the king, to his blown away mind, says, absolutely, here's you go, here's your provision. He goes on a journey, he sets out, and what's the very first thing that happens when he sets out on the journey to repair the walls? Come to verse 10 and we see this. When Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. The enemy started to get deeply disturbed. But they don't do anything. They're watching. And this is exactly what happens in your spiritual journey. The enemy watches. Most of the time, you don't even know. The enemy doesn't even know the enemy's watching. He has no clue that he's being watched. Watch this. So I came to Jerusalem, and there was three days. How many days? Three. I'm sure that's a coincidence. Then I arose in the night, and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put in my heart. And what did he do? He went around to every part of Jerusalem wall, and he inspected the wall. He didn't just show up with, uh, you know, here I is, I'm Nehemiah, don't you know about me? I have a book out there. I am the great minor prophet. I think I'm major. He took at night, he respected the rulers of the people, and at night he wanted to inspect and find out what the damage was because he was about to present his case. And the officials, in verse 16, did not know where I had gone or what I had done, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise and build. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, time out. They've been living there for years. Did nobody else notice that the walls are not built, that they're destroyed and in rubble? Did nobody else stand up and go, hey, this is probably not a good idea if anybody wants to come against us. They pretty much just walk in the doors. We don't even have gates. How many of you would take the doors off your hinges on the outside of your house and live there for years? That's what they were doing. Only in ancient times, the only protection you had was the wall around the city. They were villages, really, at the time. They were were fairly small villages. And the the wall that was around Jerusalem was not there. the, The doors themselves were burned. Nehemiah comes up and says, guys, we have a problem. What is he doing? He's taking his hand, punching it into complacency in saying, wake up, people. Are you blind? There's no doors or gates or walls. We can't live like this. The enemy is out there roaring and waiting. So here we go. So their answer, watch this. Their answer was, let us rise up and build. Then their hands... They set their hands to do this good work. And the very next thing that happens when they, remember, the enemy shows up when? When was the first time the enemy showed up? The enemy showed up when Nehemiah started his journey. He went forward. Then the enemy didn't do anything. Just watched. When's the next time the enemy shows up? When they said, let's do it. Verse 19, but when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, They laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? What is the first strategy of the enemy? The very first strategy of the enemy is this, is to convince you you can't do it and you're a joke. That's his his, his number one, is to convince you it's not real. The number one reason why this movement of the Torah is not totally penetrated the nations is because the very people that hold to the front of the book that say we got to go back to the covenant don't believe in the supernatural realm. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit to the depth that he wants to reveal himself. They don't believe in the demonic realm. Half of them don't even believe there is a Satan. Because they've absorbed Sambalat's hogwash that you can't do this. Who are you? The enemy is out there and he wants to stop us from doing this work. 
So what was his answer? Verse 20 says, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not yours. Do you realize this is your life? This is your answer. This is everything. When the enemy comes against you, this is your answer. Get behind me, Hasatan. You have no right or authority, and Jerusalem is not yours. It's mine. Last night when I prayed prophetically, I prayed something that was a bit controversial. And I said that we will storm the gates of hell. Someone said, are you sure? Actually, more than one person said that. Are you sure you want to do that? Not realizing that I wasn't challenging the enemy to some cowboy duel. The enemy has our city. Those are our walls. They're not his walls. Where do you think his walls are? Somewhere in, you know, uh, Tehran? In Pakistan? His walls are around Mount Moriah. He's taken over the mountain of our God and he's using Yahweh's walls to keep his own people out. So when I say that we are going to storm the castle, it's to take it back. It's our castle. It's our inheritance. And the God of heaven will prosper us. Chapter 3. Then Eliashiv, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. I love this verse. Why? Because for once in our life, we see shepherds at the highest level starting the work. These today, shepherds are telling you guys to do all the work. You guys need to do it. You need to do it. You need to do it. How about the priest lead the fight? We need more Judah Maccabees, who's a priest with a sword. They consecrated and hung the doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Next to Eliashiv, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zechar, the son of Imri, built. Also the sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Kaz, made repairs. Next to them, Mushalam, the son of Berchiah, the son of Meshzabel, this is challenging me, made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, made repairs. In verse 5, I love this. Next to them, the Tokyoites. Tekoites. See, the Japanese are found right here in the scripture. You don't even know that. <laughs> Listen to this. I'm going to read this again. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work. Of their Lord. I want to make a point right here. He goes through everybody's name. Have anybody ever wondered why, why do they go through all the names? I mean, hello? This is what you read at like 1130 at night when you can't go to bed. Next to them, Raphael, son of her, son of this guy, son of him. No, there's a reason because in their time, there was such thing as honor. There was such thing as that it was honorable to write their name on a stone so that every generation after that would know that my great, 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 great grandfather, he stood in the gap and he fixed the walls and he was part of the solution and not the problem. And so let me ask you today, at the same time, it was worthy enough to note that the nobles of the Tekoites chose not to get involved in the game. They chose not to be part of the solution. They chose to build their own house. They chose to take their 401ks and save up for some great time in in New Mexico when they retire, or Arizona, wherever it is. But the Tekoites, 
And all these other people, they said, hogwash, our homes are second, the walls of Jerusalem are down. We are vulnerable to the enemy. I'm all in. If the book was closed today, would your name be found as the solution, part of the solution? Would your name be found on the honor roll? I'm just asking. In every way. Name it. Spiritual gifts. Your time. Your talent. Your finances. You're going to stand before God when the priest gave 10% at the very minimum, and he says, thank you for your one and quarter percent for your whole life. You made a giant impact on my kingdom while you took your vacations and your golf trips. We should be ashamed of ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't stand before our homes and build the gates while the walls are down. And we wonder why the enemy infiltrates our homes and our families. We're not doing our part. I can't do it all. The leadership can't do it all. We need your help. I need to know what your gifts are. Last night when we had the, this, this unbelievable prayer time, I learned that some people have a gift of praying. I was blown away. Precious, when you prayed, I never opened my eyes when someone prayed before. I had to, I had to look at you to see if this wasn't pre-recorded. <laughs> she prayed so unbelievable and so articulate. At the end, no joke, I thought Jesus could be black. <laughs> I started to wonder, because I ain't never heard anybody pray like that. And I'm going to put it online so when you hear it, you will think this too. Please don't write me any emails on that, okay? I'm just not in the mood. Verse 8, next to him, Uziel, the son of Harariah, Yahweh. One of the goldsmiths made repairs. Then the perfumers. You get this? Everybody's involved. The goldsmiths, the perfumers, the ones that are doing the, 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 the what do you call them on the bottom of the horses? The, the horseshoes. Blacksmiths, thank you. Shows you how far removed we are. The guy that flips hamburgers, the guy that's an executive, the CPA, the trash collector or the sanitary engineer, however you choose to say it. Everyone is involved. There's no, like, uh, club. Everyone's involved. I want you to turn to chapter 4 as we close this out, and it says this, but it happened when Sambalat, here we go, Sambalat, the enemy's back, heard that we were rebuilding the wall. Now he went from what? The very first time, he was bothered. The second time, he made fun of them. What did he do? He tried to get into their psyche, get into their mind. And the third time, he was furious, very indignant, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke before the brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Remember, this, this, this is only the Jewish people at this time. This is the house of Judah. Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned? He's getting nervous, and he's getting ready for war. Now Tobiah the Amorite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, even a fox goes up on it, he will break it down, their stone wall. Nehemiah says, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them a plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. He goes back to prayer. This whole book is in nothing but a historical book on how to deal with the enemy. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sambalat, you see how he's showing up more and more? When the enemy heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry, and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. 
What does the enemy do? Comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and divide and conquer, create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayers to our God known. Because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. The prayers got more intense. As the battle and the progression happened, the enemy came harder. You see, if the enemy doesn't come into your life, ladies and gentlemen, you're probably doing nothing for the kingdom of God. If you haven't had a real attack and you haven't had a demonic attack on your life and you don't even know what I'm talking about, you're probably doing nothing. He's at the place where he's not even watching you. You're not even on his radar. And some of you say, well, I don't want to be on his radar. If you're not on his radar, you're not on Yahweh's radar. Yahweh only backs up those that are on the radar of the enemy. You want a one-armed angel? That's fine. That may be all that you need. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing. It's a war. There is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. Our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever you place you turn, they will be upon us. Their own people were telling them, you're crazy. You can't do this. We're not going to make it. They've already got it half built and completely surrounding the city. And their own people are beginning to turn on them because the war is raging and the battle lines are drawn. They're scared of the enemy. That's what's going on right now in this movement. And I looked and I arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore the armor, and the leaders were behind all of the house of Judah. What's, what is the learning principle here? There are those that are working, but the work doesn't do anything without the prayers and the supplications of the intercessors. Any ministry, any congregation that sets out to repair the walls of Jerusalem that does not have a praying warrior mentality will get consumed by the enemy. You want to repair the walls of your home? Let's make it personal. You can't do it by reading the Bible. I'm sorry. You can't do it by keeping the commandments. I'm sorry. You can send me emails on that. I'll give you a response. Because I know this is on stepping on somebody's toes. Because you don't understand your real theology of what the Bible says. My Bible says it's not enough to know your God. It's not enough to proclaim His name. It's not enough even to keep His commandments. You must fall on your knees and pray because we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities of this present darkness. And we as American believers don't do this. And we wonder why we are defeated in every area of our life. Why our children deny the Messiah. Why our spouses are committing adultery. Why men are caught in in pornography. And wives don't even fall on their faces for 10 hours a day. You want to see your man come back to you? Fall on your face and start doing Bible things in Bible ways. And you will see everything turn around in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time that we stand and be warriors for the Messiah. And the only way to stand to be a warrior is to get on your knees. It is the lost art that the enemy has somehow, somehow stolen this art of prayer. So we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together. So verse 22 says, At the same time I also said to the people, Let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. Skipping on to chapter 5, Then I called the priest and required an oath from them. This is Nehemiah. This is a nobody. He has no right to Jerusalem. He's, he's, meaning that he doesn't live there. This is a guy, can you imagine somebody walking in your house and saying, by the way, every door you have is off. When you get the doors back on, don't matter what my name is or where I'm from, here's what we got to do, here's the plan. Are you in or out? You better be walking in the spirit. Because it might be an angel. 
He calls the priest. Notice this. He calls the pastors, the shepherds, the leaders, the elders, and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. I'm going to end with this. Then he shook out the fold of my garment. See, they had a belt right here. He shook out the fold and said, so may God shake out each man. Boy, this is really important that you know the history behind this. Uh, they would carry grain. By, okay, they had these, these uh, we would say like long robes, and they had a, a belt. And they would pull out the, the garment, and it would make like a pouch, you see. And they would carry grain, and they would carry goods and fruit and different things back from the market. It was part of, uh, uh, it's, it's like a shopping cart, built-in shopping cart right there. So this is a really big statement that Nehemiah is making when he says this. He took the, takes the fold out of his garment, which is designed for fruit. And he shakes it and says, So may God shake out of each man from his house, from his property, who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he shake out and be empty. And all the assembly said, Amen. And praise Yahweh. Then the people did according to the promise. And we're going to stop there in our journey to him, to, through Nehemiah because this is where we are in our journey here at Passion for Truth in this ministry to take the message of the Torah to the nations. As I'm proclaiming before you today, by whatever authority that Yahweh has given me as a modern day priest, may Yahweh shake you out and make you empty if you do not repair the wall that's in front of you. There are people that are relying on you. There are families that are dying on the vine. You are not a receiver. You are a giver. We are not the tail, ladies and gentlemen. We are the head. Yahweh calls his people for a purpose, to be a light to the nations. I know you're broken down. I know you're hurting. I know you're depressed. I know that you are, you are in bondage and some of you are in sin and your families have fallen apart. I'm telling you right now, get your eyes on the kingdom and seek first his kingdom and start feeding the other sheep around you and you will find out that your sins that beset you once before and inhibited you and became walls in front of you will come down. You build Yahweh's walls and the walls that are protecting, that are keeping you from the Lord will fall. Your chains will fall. When did the chains fall? When there was supplication. Peter's chains fell when the saints were praying. We receive not because we what? Ask not. How do you ask? On your knees in prayer, in supplication. Fast for crying out loud. Die if it takes it. Fast until you get an answer from the Most High God. And if you die, so be it. You will live on the third day. Why is it that we're so afraid of pain and suffering in America? Why is it that we can't even suffer for a brother? Why is it that we are so modest ourselves, we feel bad about calling a brother at 2 o'clock in the morning because you need prayer? Because you don't want to wake them up. You know why they feel bad? Because we've made them feel that way. Why is it that we don't, we don't wake each other up in the middle of the night and we're like, man, I'm so glad you called, brother. I'm out. I'm on it. I'm on my knees right now praying for you. Why is it we don't have that kind of love for one another? Why is it that we don't, how is it that we love our sleep while the enemy is awake. We are slumbering, ladies and gentlemen. And when we pray, we don't even know how to pray. We don't even know what anguish is. Matt, find David Wilkerson, Call to Anguish, on YouTube right now, please, if you can. David Wilkerson, Call to Anguish. We don't know what it means to be baptized, as David Wilkerson says, in anguish. This is what the patriarchs did. They submerged themselves in tears. When was the last time that you cried for your, sp your spouse? That you set tears for your children? That you skipped a meal just so that you could sense the Holy Spirit deeper and thicker and wider? Have you ever sensed the Holy Spirit in your life? Let me say something that might blow some of you away. How do you know you're saved? My God says through his son that if you are saved, you will walk with greater things than I did. 
You will walk, you will pick up serpents and they won't bite you. You will drink poison and it won't hurt you. You will lay your hands on people and they will be healed. You will arise in the morning. You will not have sins that will beset you. You will not lie in bondage. Are you sure that you have the living Ruach HaKadosh living inside of you? Jim, you're going over the board. Yes, I am. Someone's got to go overboard because Nineveh's dying. Someone's got to be willing to cross the line. And maybe I'll go too far. But some of you are already over the line. Some of you need Yeshua again. Some of you need to fall on your faces. And you need to repent of your sin. I know I sound like a Southern Baptist preacher, but ladies and gentlemen, we need this. We need this. Some of you say, you know, I, I, I just want a small Bible study. I just want a home group. I, 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 don't, want, I don't want this big, big stuff. I, I, don't, I don't want that. What you're really saying is you don't want the prophets to come true. Because Yahweh says to the prophets, he wants the whole world to come to know this stuff. And all while you just take his word and you want to succumb to it and you want, all the, you want all the knowledge, you want to learn all the mysticism and you want to know who the Antichrist is. I'm tired of answering questions about the end of time. When the end of time comes, I'll let you know. Yeah. 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 Ladies, we need to get prepared for the end of time. And the only way that you're going to survive the great tribulation is not going to be through a long black coat with shotguns and grenades and buckets of grain. You will survive on your knees. Amen. Our knees need to have callousness. We need to be numb. Your stomachs need to hurt from praying so hard. I've never prayed so hard in my life than I've prayed in the last week. I've never cried so hard. My stomach has never hurt this much from being so passionate in prayer. You know why? Because Abba's starting to give me his heart. And I'm starting to see that this world is falling apart and his people are dead. They proclaim with their lips that Yeshua is Lord, but their hearts are so far from them, they don't even know the Holy Spirit. If it knocked them upside the head, they'd probably say and deny it and think it's a demon, if they believed in demons. We don't walk in the supernatural because we don't pray in the supernatural. We pray like it's some Santa Claus genie. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get the religion out of us and get on our knees before our God. Nothing will change. He says that he doesn't do anything until, until he gives the words to his prophets. What do you think the prophets are doing all the time? Have you ever wondered why nothing happens except for the word through the prophets? The prophets spend most of their time on their knees. How do you think they hear from the Lord? Turn your televisions off, ladies and gentlemen. Why do you spend an average of 20 hours a week listening to someone speak to you that's not the Lord God? Give it a try. Sit in sackcloth and ashes. Had a friend this week. Spend three full days in the Word. Eight hours a day in the Word. Eight hours a day in the Word. One day you'll hear the testimony of how it revolutionized and changed his life. Like there's no tomorrow. When was the last time that you spent five minutes? And some of you are like, man, my bottom hurts for sitting here for two hours. Shame on you. Shame on you that you can't sit here for two hours. Shame on you that we can't get on our knees for 10 minutes while our children are on their way to hell. Who will stand in the gap? Who will repair the walls if one person doesn't do it? It's a door to the enemy to the entire congregation. And I pray, and I do, I may be the only pastor on the planet earth that will ever pray this prayer. Because there ain't maybe three people left when I'm done. <laughs> but I declare like Nehemiah did. I'm not in this to play church. I'm in this for war. And I say, Father, if there's a family in this house that doesn't want to repair the wall, remove them from the city and replace them with someone who's willing to work. 
This is not about sitting. It's about being engaged with a sword in one hand and the Word of God in another. A shovel in one hand and the Word in the other. Did you, did you find that clip? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what this is? This is not just any sword. This is a replica that I purchased in Scotland. This is a William Wallace Braveheart sword. And trust me, you'll know it when you touch it. Because this thing, I would not want to look into the eyes of the person that could swing this. Because it is heavy. It is solid. It is sharp. Just to be able to swing this, the amount of strength. I'm telling you right now, let me just show you how weak I am. I'm going to do this, okay? Guy's coming at me. First, I have to pull it back without it making me fall on, the, on the, my bottom. <laughs> I don't know how they did it. You know why? I can't do this because I'm not in shape and not qualified to hold this sword. So what does someone do that's not qualified to hold a sword? I hide behind my shield. And that's what we've been doing for 2,000 years. If we want to win this war, and I'm telling you, it's already won. We need to go outside of time. And we need to prepare to be able to pick up this sword. And the only way that you can be prepared is to be on your knees. So I'm going to make a challenge to every single one of you in the, in the sound of my voice. I'm going to challenge you. This is going to be far outside of your comfort zone. I'm going to challenge you to pray on your knees. This is pathetic challenge, actually. On your knees for seven days, 30 minutes a day. I'm embarrassed before my God that it's only 30 minutes. Some of you do not understand what's happening in this ministry. Some of you do not understand the battle that is before us. There are only two ministries worldwide that are media-driven, that are reaching the multitudes for the nations for Torah. And that doesn't come from me. That is just a fact. And we are one of them. We are in a Nehemia moment. If it's not us, it's down to one. And if it's not him, it's not happening. Before every great move of Yahweh, there was one man that stood in the gap and said, there's holes in the wall. Who's with me? Who's with me? And they got on their faces, sackcloth and ashes, fasted and prayed, until Yahweh gave them a word and gave them victory. And when he said go, it didn't matter if there was only three people behind them. They went to war. And so I'm saying this right now, not figuratively, not spiritually or emotionally. I'm asking and I'm begging. This war is real. There's no time to mess around. There's no time for sin. There's no time for TV. I need to know Who's with him? Because this war will only be won when we stand up and we get in the game. Father, I just pray for your people right now. I'm exhausted. I don't know if I spoke your words tonight, Father. I had no idea what you really want to say. But Father, I know if you just had one person, just one, one person in the sound of my voice that would go all in. They wouldn't care about their house, or their home, their retirement, 
cars, money, vacations. What would it be like? Just one would be willing to give it all. To study day and night. Do the best that they can. Pray. Be on their knees. They set their alarm for 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. Spend 30 minutes. Be uncomfortable. I'm taking that challenge, Father. I will do that. At 2.22 every morning, I will wake up for the next seven days and I will pray for 30 minutes. I give you my word. I want to see your hand move. I want to see your people humbled and grown and matured and healed. Father, I love your people. I love them. It hurts me that I can't touch every single one and pray with every one. Would you send more shepherds? Father, stir the hearts of those that have ears to hear and eyes to see. This is not an eloquent message. It's a simple message. That if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal the land. Humility, prayer, repentance. It's a simple formula. While the enemy tries to seek whom he may devour, most of us have no clue that he's even there. Because we do not walk in the spirit realm. Father, forgive us for our apathy, our laziness, for not really caring. Forgive us for letting the enemy in our lives. And we don't even know it in our homes. Father, forgive our men for being drunkards in every way, slumbering and slothful, So we don't know how to lead. The first step is lead. Father, we fall on our knees before you. And we commit that if there's nobody else to go, we'll go. And if there's others that have gone before us, we will still go. And when you have enough, we will go again. Forgive us and our fathers and all the generations past for the traditions and doctrines of men that we've held so dear that we actually love them more than we do do you. Forgive us that when your truth is set before us, we despise it. We don't want to do it. Father, would you pour out your spirit among your people? Humble us again. I want to see Acts 2 squared. I do, Lord. I'm not satisfied with Acts 2. We're 2,000 years removed, and a lot more people need to be healed than 3,000. Father, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go from here. I don't know what to say. I'm not eloquent enough to display your heart to your people. So I will just say, move on your hearts. Move on their hearts. Let it be different from here on out. Let them see that sin is nothing but a trap to paralyze us from building the wall. There's Kenyans who need to hear this message. Why is it that we do not care about those that are in villages that travel a week just to get online? I pray for our missionaries, Father. Give them strength. And may God raise up more missionaries that would say, here am I. Where should I go? What should I do? What part of the wall? What's my gift? What's my talent? May you raise up warriors again, Lord. And Father, protect our children for we have let them down 
Father, I love our children. Keep them here. Keep them safe and strong. Let them teach us how to pray. May God forgive us and have mercy on us. Amen. Yahweh says that he wants to pour out his spirit. He showed me a vision of his cup tilted. And I asked him last night, Father, why did you show me this? Why did you stop? And only, we only got a, a few drops. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why did you stop? And now I know after my own message, I know. Because he says he's not sure if we really want it. We haven't beseeched him. We don't deserve it. We haven't done the work. We want all the blessings. But we're not willing to obey. Unbelievable. The most powerful commandment in all the Bible (laughs) is not even in the Torah but it's written all over the Torah. It's pray. It's pray. It's pray. May the Lord bless you this next coming week and may his face shine upon you. May his countenance somehow be lifted on you. May he have grace on us. May he give you shalom on your knees. For those of you that need to go or need to be dismissed, you're dismissed. For those of you online that are listening to me right now, I don't know how you can be involved, but repair the breach in your own neighborhood, in your own home. Husbands, repent before your wives for being harsh, not listening to them, not loving them, catering to them, valuing them. I want to say thank you for your support. I don't say it enough. People's lives are being changed because of you, because you're building the wall, repairing it. Would you take the challenge and spend 30 minutes on your knees? Some of you that are already intercessors, double that. Be real. 30 minutes is nothing for you. All of our patriarchs, three times a day. Three times a day. I'm asking for one, just to train us. Some of you fasted for the first time ever this last week. I'm asking you to do it once a week. Our forefathers in the first century did it twice a week. Look how weak we are. I'm asking you to do it once a week, Thursday night to Friday night, for the next 30 days, and spend 30 minutes on your knees. We want to see a revival of his word in the earth. This is where it starts. 
This is where it begins. Be all in, ladies and gentlemen. Do what Abba tells you to do. We need your help. He needs your help. Plan A is for his people to be a light to the nations. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. We're his only plan. He's counting on you. He's counting on you. Okay.